concept of discipleship. And if you're like me, the first couple of weeks, I'm like, oh, that's, that's good, that's good. But I kind of felt like I had discipleship in a box. Like, I, you, know, like you, know the, you know what to say, you know what it is, you know how, what to feel. But man, has the Lord been stirring on my heart, been um, breaking that box open and really wooing me like only God can do toward this, this thing that God does in us, which is to want to replicate who he is in other people. So good morning. My name is Dr. C. I'm one of the founding pastors of the church. So I'm so glad that you're here today, and we're going to be talking about being disciple makers. So let's get started. This is the verse that really kind of captured my attention, because listen to what it says. I brought glory to you here on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. So I'm thinking, I'm thinking about this, just, you know, meditating on the verse. I brought glory to you here on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. Now, as a Christian, someone that was raised in the church, I know and I understand that the main purpose Jesus lived, was born and lived a sinless life was to die on the cross for my sins. It was to be raised from the dead and to be interceding for me today. So how, what struck me as odd was, how can Jesus say that he has completed the work that God gave him to do when he hadn't, hadn't gone to the cross yet? Hadn't even said, if it's, if it's not your will, take this cup from me. How did he, what was he saying he completed? The rest of the verses give us um, insight into what is so important that Jesus said, okay, I've completed this. Me completing this has brought you glory. Now, Father, bring me into the glory we shared before the world began. I have revealed you to the ones you gave me from this world. They were always yours. You gave them to me. and They have kept your word. Now they know that everything I have is a gift from you. For I have passed on to them the message you gave me. They accepted it and know that I came from you. And they believed that you sent me. Now, making disciples was part of Jewish culture. The, the world, the century, the part of the world where Jesus was born, they were very familiar with making disciples. Everybody had disciples. John the Baptist had disciples. The Pharisees had disciples. And if you were a Jewish boy, by the time you were 13, you had memorized what we have, what we call the first five books of the Bible, they called it the Pentateuch. They had memorized that, and they had also memorized some of the prophets. Now, if you were the, the brightest bulb in the, in the jar, and you were the smartest, you would be chosen to go to rabbinical school. That was a very special honor. So you would choose a teacher, a disciple, and you would study under them, and you would follow what they did. You would copy what they did. You would imitate them. You would teach what they taught. You would be like them. And if you weren't the, the best and the brightest, then you most likely would go back to your parents' occupation, whether it was, in Jesus' case, it was a carpenter or a fisherman or a farmer or a shepherd. So discipling and discipleship was something that was very familiar to this culture. So when Jesus said go to his disciples at the very end, when he's going to heaven, he says, now go into all the world and make disciples, teaching them to obey everything that I have taught you. What did James and John and all the other disciples think what Jesus meant when he said, go and make disciples? I'm going to give you two things. We're going to start with two things that are not the way to make disciples. Two things that Jesus did not mean when he said, go and make disciples. The first one is, you don't practice what you teach. This is just true for anything, right? One of the things that grade us is if we find someone that's being a hypocrite, or if we find that in ourselves, that we're being hypocritical. 
It's just something unnerving about that. So here's what Jesus says to his disciples. The entire chapter of Matthew, which we don't have time, and some of the verses you'll see I put dot, 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 because we just don't have time to read the full passage. I haven't changed the meaning of anything. It's just for time purposes. So please go home and read it for yourself. Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees are the official interpreters of the laws of Moses. So practice and obey whatever they tell you. Don't follow their example. For they don't practice what they teach. They crush people with unbearable religious demands. So Jesus wasn't saying to us today, don't disciple don't go and make disciples. He's saying, don't make disciples this way. The things that you tell people, you have to live that life. You have to be who you say you are. So the second thing, before we get into discipleship, to not to be a disciple like Jesus wants us to make your disciples divisive. Now we're flipping over to the words of Paul, and he's noticing in the churches that are planted, that people are starting to be divided into groups and starting to be partisan. And so he says in this one particular place, although he says it over and over in different books, you are jealous of one another and quarrel with each other. Doesn't that prove you are controlled by your sinful nature? Now that's, that's an indictment right there. We could just stop and go home right there, but we're going to keep going. Aren't you living like people of the world. When one of you says, I'm a follower of Paul, and another says, I follow Apollos, are you acting just like people of the world? Now we know that Apollos was someone that was a teacher, and he was, by history, he was just a, a brilliant orator. He, he, could, he could teach, and people just loved to listen to him and loved what he had to say. So some people were like, well, I, I follow Apollos. After all, who is Apollos? Who is Crystal? Who is Mark? Who is Peter? We are only God's servants through whom you believed the good news. Each of us did the work the Lord gave us. I planted the seed in your hearts. Apollos watered it, but it was God who made it grow. It's not important who does the planting or who does the watering. What's important is that God makes the seed grow. The one who plants and the one who waters work together with the same purpose. And both will be rewarded for their hard work. He's saying here, part of what he's saying here too is sometimes that when we, we, we're making disciples and we're working with people, they kind of start to sound like us and dress like us and things like that. But your children are going to look like you. Your disciples should look like Jesus. I mean, they're going to, you're going to, they're going to be watching your life. They're going to be imitating you as you imitate Christ. But your disciples should look like Jesus. That should be the main characteristic that we see. So I'm going to talk, just we're going to get on to the main part here. I was thinking about discipleship. And as I talk to people, you know, as weeks go on, months go on, years go on, decades go on, you, you kind of see a pattern and people will fall into one of, uh, one of two camps. Either they'll get extremely discouraged because the people that they talk to don't seem to take that step or don't seem to be interested in a relationship with God, or even taking the next step and finding out who God is. So there's that camp of people. And then there's the other side where people kind of get, I hate to use the word prideful, but that's how it sounds, that, well, I have so many converts, I have so many disciples, just kind of swings to that side. So I wanted to break down what parts make up discipleship. What is really involved? Now, this kind of discipleship I'm talking about is the kind that Jesus left us as his last commandment. Go into all the world and make disciples. So that's not disciples that churches change, people change membership from one church to come to our church 
or we're working with the children of the Christians in our church. That, that is the part of discipleship. But what we're talking about right now is when you go into all the world, go to where you work, go to where you go to school, go where your mission field is, and try to make disciples. And we're going to say what the three parts are. The first part is, will you say it with me? God's part. And we kind of skip over this, God's part. We all know God has a part in it, but we don't necessarily give him the credit for, for who he is and what he does. It's God. Let's, let's look at the verse. John 6, 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them to me. I'm going to read that again. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them to me. And at the last day, I will raise them up. It's, God is the, is, the, is the main, the principal character in bringing someone to the Lord. And I know he uses us, and we're going to get to our part, and our part's a big deal. But the first part, the primary part, the part that keeps us from getting discouraged in our walk, discouraged in what we've been called to do. Because remember, Jesus said, I'm bringing you glory, Father, by completing the work you called me to do. So when we're trying to complete the work that God called us to do, it's easy to get discouraged if we don't remember that God is the one who draws people. He's the main, he is the activator. He is the one that woos our hearts, woos that person from whatever situation they're in. We, the, the, well, I'll get to that in a moment. It's just, um, God is a big deal. Do y'all know that, right? He's a big deal. He's the one, he's the one that draws people. Okay. He's also the one that brings them across your path. He's the one that puts it in your heart to talk to that person. He's not just the person that's been working on that heart, been working behind the scenes. He's also the person that, that convicts you, that, that, that woos you to care about someone else, that woos you to go out of your comfort zone and to share your story with someone. So we're going to spend a few moments on, of course, our part. So it's God's part, our part, and then their part. So our part is, of course, the one that we need to be concerned with the most, right? Because God's going to take care of his part. Anybody have a question that God's not going to do his part, or God's not able to do his part, or that God is somehow unwilling to do his part? No. No. This is the part that catches us, that snags us. If I were to ask you all though this morning, how many of us truly desire to bring someone into a relationship with Jesus? I would say most of us would raise our hands. Most of us would say, it's my desire to do that. I really want to do that. But I'm scared. I'm afraid. I'm inadequate. I'm busy, it's the wrong season of life. I mean, the, the list of why we don't do our part is long. But let's just start, let's just take this apart for a moment. Now, think before we start on our part, think about that verse that we just, that we started with. Jesus said, I bring you glory by completing the work. And then later he tells the disciples, now wait, don't start until, I send the Holy, until God sends the Holy Spirit. So even in that first verse, that, that foundation verse for this morning, Jesus did had a part. His part was that he completed the work of making disciples that God asked him to do. God's part was he was going to send the Holy Spirit to indwell those disciples, and they weren't to try to get started until he had come. But then there was a third part, even in that one passage of Scripture, because the disciples all had to make a choice. I will follow you, 
and to drop everything and follow Jesus. So even in that very first scripture, we see the three parts working together. So let's begin. Paul is instructing this young church. He is like a father to them. And he's giving them a blueprint for how to make disciples. Because, you know, Paul was a master at going into a new environment, going into a different culture, meeting all kinds of people, and understanding and knowing how to speak with them. What to say that would cause them to to ask questions and to lean in and want to learn more about this, in one place he said, this unknown God. So he's instructing his disciples in that young church, into how, about, how to go about making disciples. Devote yourselves to prayer with an alert mind and a thankful heart. Oh, we could stop right there. <laughs> Devoting ourselves to prayer. If we just took a small poll, I'm not going to do it to you because I'd have to raise my hand too. Am I devoted to prayer? I'll throw one, I'll do a Hail Mary when when I'm going into. He's saying, devote, be devoted to prayer. Pray for us too, that God will give us many opportunities to speak about his mysterious plan concerning Christ. That is why I am here in chains. So he's saying, because he's talking about Christ, because he's sharing the truth of the gospel. He's been locked up. And so he's writing this letter in prison. Pray that I will proclaim this message as clearly as I should. Now here are the instructions. Live wisely among those who are not believers. Now, it would be easy to say, okay, live wisely among believers. Because we have enough problems just getting along with our brothers and sisters in the Lord. Right? Let's just be honest. We do. I mean, our way is probably the best way that God has planned, and their way is the second best. So he's not even talking about getting along with brothers and sisters in the Lord, or your husband, or your wife, or your children. He's saying that when you are among people who are not believers, I was thinking about that translation. I know in other parts of the New Testament, it talks about if you are not a Christian, you, the Bible says you're actually spiritually dead, dead in your trespasses and sins. And so every person that we meet, and, and what I'm going to say is antagonistic to someone who is not a believer, because everyone is born in sin, every single person. And up until the time you make a decision a reasoned decision, as well as an emotional decision, to say, I believe you are who you said you are, and I am going to put my faith and my trust in you. Up until that point, it doesn't matter how good you are. It doesn't matter how many, how generous you are. It doesn't matter that the sinner down the street is a better person than you, which it's a sad indictment, but it's still, in this issue, has no value. If you haven't accepted Jesus as your Savior, then the Bible says you are unbeliever, not a believer, or you're dead in your sins. So Paul is trying to tell us here how to make a new disciple. How to how to how to what's that process that starts when that person is not a believer? And the first thing he says to do is live wisely among people who are not believers. What does that mean? What does that mean to you? He's saying, make the most of every opportunity. That's hard to do. I'd be lucky if I make the most of one opportunity a month, one opportunity a year. But he's saying, look, I'm in prison, and I need you to be out there making disciples. And the way you do that is make the most of every opportunity. And and what do you do with that opportunity? Let your conversation be, say it with me, gracious and attractive. So that you will have the right response for everyone.
I was thinking about why, 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 why this order, why this intensity, why? I mean, we are talking about eternal life. But I was thinking that people that are spiritually dead, or as he says here, not believers, they're going to have attitudes and they're going to have beliefs and they're going to have behaviors that are antagonistic toward God. You say, well, my neighbor isn't a Christian. They, don't, they, 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 they say they're atheists, but man, they're, they're such nice people. And we all know plenty of people that aren't nice people and aren't believers. But Paul is saying, we have to live wisely because sin has touched every family on the planet. Sin has, has every person and every family has been riddled by sin. So Paul is saying, look, these people are unbelievable. They don't know God. And so they're going to have attitudes antagonism toward God, uh, belief that he even exists, uh, cursing him to their dying day because of what happened to their father or their mother. I mean, you have to live wisely because their attitudes, what they believe, we, I believe the Bible's a myth. I believe all of these things that come in a, a human package, every person has a different story. Every family has a different story. So Paul is saying, look, we need to make disciples because that's the last thing Jesus told us to do. That's what he spent three years of his ministry doing. Yes, he healed the sick. Yes, he raised the dead. Yes, he fed the crowds. Yes, he, he taught on the hillside. But what does he say he did right before Gethsemane? He says, I've completed the work you gave me to do. I've taken 12 men and I've told them everything there is to know. Everything I have is from you. And they've received that. Because let's just, let's just think for a moment. If Jesus had gone on, died on the cross, was resurrected by God's power, the Holy Spirit descends, there would be no witnesses. There would be, here's a story, there's a story, everywhere's a story, story. That he needed disciples. He needed people that could tell the story of who Jesus was and what he did. And to write down legitimate accounts of the gospel. To be credible witnesses. So he said, I've done that. I've made disciples. And these are disciples that submit one to another. These are disciples that put themselves last. These are not disciples like you're used to seeing disciples. Making, giving themselves the best. Giving themselves the best seat. The best food. The best of everything. These are my disciples. They will wash your feet. They will care for you. But they will have power from the Holy Spirit. To be a witness for me. So when Paul says, Be, live wisely among those who are not believers, because those are who we're sent to reach. I can't reach the people that God has in your life. You can't reach the person that's sitting behind you. Their sphere of influence. But as complicated as families are, as burdened as people are, it seems really complicated. And so a lot of times we don't want to go out and we don't want to start talking because they're going to ask a question I don't know the answer to. I don't know why God allowed this stuff in the Old Testament. I don't know what this term means. I don't know. So I'm not going to say anything. But let me encourage you. You will be a disciple maker as you start to go and talk and tell your story. You're not going to have all the answers, but if you let fear stop you because you don't have the right word or you don't know what the word is for whatever, even though people who are not believers, people who are dead in their sin, 
even though their needs are all individual and unique and real, their needs are not complicated. Because we're all made the same way. We all have the same desires for love and to be nurtured. We all have the same. So their needs are very, very simple. Even though the conversations might not be simple. What they need, someone who is dead in their trespasses and are alienated from God. What they need is for you to be who you say you are. If you are a Christian, they need to see you acting like a Christian and talking like a Christian. And I don't mean like a Pharisee, but I mean, I have yet to hear a person, I was sharing this with the ladies group Monday night, I've never met a person or read about a person, maybe there is one in history, but people love Jesus, but they don't like Christians. And if we are not living like Christ, we are not reflecting Christianity. So even though their situation is complicated, they hate God. They don't believe God exists. They think it's a myth. They think whatever. It's complicated. But what they truly need, how many times did Jesus look at someone and the question they were were asking, he didn't even answer because that wasn't their true need. Their needs are simple. They need you to be who you say you are. They need someone that can help them find answers to the questions they have. You might not have the answer, but you are a resource for them. You can take them by the hand and have them come to one of the classes or say, we'll find it out together. But you don't need to be afraid of that because that person is separated from God and God is the one that's drawing them. And if he's put you across their path, open your mouth and tell your story. It can be as simple as that. Say, Lord, this is like the the little boy with the loaves and the fishes. It is a simple meal, but I'm giving it to you. This is a simple testimony. I know there's people that have sensational ones. Mine's not that, but I'm offering it to you as I'm talking with this person. I'm telling you their needs are not complicated. They need you to be who you say you are. They need someone that can help them find answers to their questions. They need someone to explain the gospel message. What does it mean to be born again? That's what That's what we do. When he said, live wisely among those, make the most of every opportunity, let your conversation be gracious and attractive, that means don't let your own personality be the thing that stops them from seeing Christ. Be gracious. When people have a problem with with Christians, they have a problem with Christ. You say, well, no, not, not Jesus is the, no, but you're the only Jesus they know. You're the only one with skin on them that, that, that says they have a relationship with God. So let your conversation be gracious and attractive. Amen. Are you with me so far? We're going to finish up here. Then there's their part. When you get to this part, we go, phew. So if, they, so if I do all that and, and they don't respond, then phew, okay, that's on them. And that's true. Let me quickly, quickly read this. As Jesus was starting out on his way to Jerusalem, a man came running up to him, knelt down and asked, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And I've taken out, Jesus said all these different commandments, a, a, long, a, a strict list. He said, but to answer your question, you know the commandments. So he, the man said, this young man, Teacher, I've obeyed all these commandments since I was young. Looking at the man, what did Jesus feel for this man? He felt genuine love. He wasn't impatient. He wasn't distracted. He wasn't, oh, that's just, he felt genuine love. There is still, and here again, see, Jesus sees what's really, what the need is, not what he's asking. There's still one thing you haven't done, he told him. Go and sell all your possessions. Give the money to the poor. You will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. At this, the man's face, let's say it together, fell. And he went away sad. And we, as we think about the account of Jesus, there were people that did not walk with Jesus for many reasons. 
And they walked with him for a while and then they stopped walking with him for many reasons. But this is this man's reason. This was his point where he said, I can't do that. So there's their part. Small group questions. Would you stand with me, please? God's part, our part, and their part. We're responsible for one sliver of that. That's for how we walk, how we live, how we talk, and how we share. We don't have to be scholars or theologians or miracle workers. We have to be faithful people that share what God is doing in our life and help them find the answers that they have. Amen. This has been a great month. It's been a challenging month for me on discipleship because I just kind of put it in a little box and left it there. It was a nice little tidy box, but I was missing, forgotten. It's strange to think that a pastor would think that people are going to hell, whatever God decides that that separation from him looks like. But that's why Jesus said, go. Go into every place and tell them about me. Amen? Okay, let's pray. Father, you see my heart, you see each heart here. And once again, you know my real need. And you know the real need of people here. But Father, our desire is to bring you glory by completing the work that you gave me to do, that you gave them to do. So Father, help us to recognize opportunities. Help us not to let fear or embarrassment or pride Hold us back from opening our mouth and sharing what you've done in our life. Father, the need is real, and we recognize that. Father, we say, here we are. Send us. We love you, and we thank you. And we give you the glory, Father. In Jesus' name, amen.